have a, a pretty good crowd in here now. I think we're just going to give it a one or two more minutes and hopefully we'll get a couple more people. But if you are already here, thank you for joining us. And uh, I appreciate your patience while we wait to officially kick off this tablet live event. Again, I'm joined here by Joel Kotkin, author of two recent articles for tablet. One of them is the end of New York and the other is who prospers after the plague. I think I have that headline correct. I did write that headline or help write that headline. So I hope I have it correct. Um, but I think Joel, what you were just touching on is a good introduction to uh, the themes at play in those pieces. And that's really, what are the disparate economic impacts that COVID is having right now in terms of the, uh, the disparate impacts on working class and let's say uh, middle and upper middle class Americans at the moment and, and what will be the long term effects as those disparate impacts entrench in the economy and, and uh, lead to second and third order effects. Um, well, well, if I could just start on that, the, the issue which I'm most concerned with right now, which is the dislocations that are taking place in exactly the places that have been hardest hit, working class neighborhoods, uh, particularly in New York, of course. I mean, if you go into any New York office building, hotel, the people who work there, they're not living in the swank east, you know, the high rises on the east side. They're living in crowded older buildings in Queens and Brooklyn. Um, I, I want to state, you know, my family roots go in New York are at least 120 years old. Um, and, uh, you know, we've, uh, uh, and so, you know, this is not like always in the great that New York's having these issues. I think, that, but, but I do think that these are issues that are bigger than New York. Um, yeah. We look at some of the, uh, the um, employment, hospitality, um, retail, uh, um, those kind of jobs, I think are gonna be restaurant workers. Right. We're talking about millions and millions of people who are not going to do as well as the computer programmer right. who works for Amazon or, or works for uh, uh, a big retail company that's going online. That person um, is gonna be in demand um, and those companies are going to do you know, relatively well. Uh, it's I'm sorry to cut you off, Joel. Yeah. Sorry about that. Let me just uh, do a brief introduction here, and then we're going to sure. get right back to the point you're making. I think we've got a great crowd here now. Uh, thanks again for joining us, if you are here now with us. Uh, my name is Jacob Siegel. I'm a senior writer, and I'm one of the hosts of Tablet Live, which is the new series that you're here to watch right now. So congratulations for getting in early. You know, you'll be able to say I was there when it was still cool. Hopefully someday this gets so popular it's no longer cool. But right now, we're still in the cool early trendsetter phase. So uh, congratulations on getting in. The idea for this is to bring live events to your home. Some of them will be talks like this with esteemed authors and tablet contributors like Joel Kotkin. Some of them will be living room concerts like we just had with Eve Barzilai of the great band Clem Snide. And uh, we'll also be having assorted other literary events, possibly some theater or dance performances, radio plays. Really what we're aiming to do is foster some community here and bring you some live experiences um, to your living room while you were under quarantine to keep us all together, to keep you entertained and to give you some uh, a kind of informal curriculum for what Tablet's thinking about these days. So just before we get into the heart of this conversation, a couple more administrative notes. This Thursday night at 7 p.m., Tablet deputy editor and unorthodox host Stephanie Butnick is going to be hosting an event, and that'll feature Keith Gessen and Esther Safran Forward, two authors, and they're going to be talking about a century of personal Jewish history. And that's going to be a book event this Thursday night at 7 p.m. And uh, you're, going to, you're going to see now that we have the chat disabled for this talk, but we have the Q&A all set up. So if you look at the bottom of your screen, 
You'll see right in the middle, there's a button that says Q&A. Feel free to jump in there, please, and ask questions. Joel and I are gonna talk for about 30 minutes. We're gonna discuss his recent articles. And then after that, we're gonna take questions from all of you. So I am, I'm looking forward uh, to doing that, but you can ask your questions at any time. You don't need to, uh, you don't need to wait for anything to do that. So um, I hope to see some people start asking questions now, like, uh, I don't know, Hudson Leibovitz, for instance, uh, anybody else who is here with us. So just to give uh, a bit of an introduction to our guest, Joel Kotkin. Uh, Joel is many things. He's a presidential fellow in urban futures at Chapman University in Orange, California, uh, where he is now. He's the executive director of the Urban Reform Institute in Houston, Texas, and he's the author of eight books, including most recently, the Coming of Neo-Feudalism, A Warning to the Global Middle Class, which is going to be out in May from Encounter and which Joel can tell us a, a bit more about. But really the themes of that book, which are about the, the collapse of the private sector middle class in America and the private sector working class in America and the consolidation of power among an oligarchic class are very much what Joel discusses in his recent articles for Tablet and, and part of what we're going to be talking about here. So before we get into it, Joel, anything you want to add to that? Uh, no, just to say that uh, I, I am a native New Yorker um, and, uh, you know, that I'm, I'm in touch with people in New York all the time. And, and uh, what I really want to accomplish is to get people to start thinking in new terms about cities and to understand that the challenges um, that are facing New York and other dense urban areas have to be confronted, not ignored. Yeah. What do you think people are missing right now, Joel? What do you think the biggest issues impacting cities that are not widely understood are? Um, well, I think there are several things. One, um, I think that there is a reluctance on the part of what you might call the urbanist lobby or the density lobby to think that there's any relationship between density, people traveling in the subway, um, and the the and and even the the high rates in some of the suburban areas of Long Island and Westchester, um, just sort of saying no, this isn't it. It's something else. And fundamentally, I don't think that's very persuasive. Uh, certainly, if you look at other American cities. Um, they're not having anything like this effect. And where we're seeing the highest rates of infection, not just here, but all around the world, it's almost always in the urban centers. And this, you know, I, I've written about the history of cities, and I think this has been common throughout. Um, if you read John Barry's a book about the, the great influenza, the Spanish flu, which was infinitely worse than this in terms of its effects, um, it was, uh, it hit the very dense urban areas. And what I think is important is to begin to start thinking about, not about how can we get more density, how can we get more people crowded into the trains, is how can we evolve the city to be a little less dense, to be a little bit more neighborhood centered, um, and a little bit more centered on places where people can walk, um, bike, and if necessary, drive. Um, I don't see how um, you go back, back to the way things were and the direction where the city was going, the, let's say Hudson Yards being the epitome yeah. of that. Yeah. Um, I, I, that was not working at all, and I, uh, even before. And I think one of the things I think it's really important in, for these pieces is all the trends that I discussed, even the ones in the piece about New York, were existent before COVID. Let's take a step back and, and identify those trends. And for anybody listening, when Joel talks about Hudson Yards, that's a kind of shorthand for the mega development approach in New York that's really not neighborhood centric at all. Um, and, and in fact, Hudson Yards doesn't, uh, you know, it's a development that, that does, exists sort of outside of the schematic of neighborhoods in New York. But if we look at Joel's two recent pieces for Tablet, again, one of them is the end of New York, and then the most recent is who prospers after the plague. I think, uh, let me attempt to give a, a potted summary, Joel, and then you can jump in. 
the end of New York is really about what you were just describing, which is the ways in which uh, there was already a decline in process in New York. And that decline could be measured in a net out-migration of people who were actually leaving the city. Uh, it could be measured in the uh, relative decline in innovation coming out of a big city like New York. It could be measured in the relative reliance, over-reliance, I think uh, you and, and certainly I would agree, uh, would say on the financial sector as opposed to the other traditional uh, industries in New York that had employed uh, the middle class and that also provided a tax base. So you had this process of contraction already in place in New York. There were some people who spent uh, you know, parts of the early 2000s arguing that uh, New York in particular, but cities more generally were these sorts of uh, creative furnaces where these different uh, emerging industries and creative industries in particular, they, they functioned as hubs. And obviously that was true to some extent, but not so much so that it actually grew these cities. Your point overall is that New York was declining or contracting prior to coronavirus and now that New York has been so disproportionately impacted, that process is going to accelerate. And then your second piece, which is really fits um, in tandem with the argument about New York specifically, is about the uneven or disparate impact in terms of the class dimensions of the coronavirus. And the simplest way, I think, to summarize that would be to say, look who's out of work right now and look who's able to go on working with a less significant disruption, not to say no disruption. But the people who are most significantly impacted economically and, and employment-wise by coronavirus are people in physical industries that require physical proximity. So that includes our large precarious service sector in America. Uh, it includes uh, people who uh, work in, in tight environments in retail, in manufacturing, um, all of these industries that were already either precarious, uh, by their nature precarious, because they don't provide full-time salaried employment with benefits, or precarious in the sense that, like manufacturing, they've been declining over the years. Whereas the kind of professional managerial class sectors, the upper middle class sectors, um, are doing a lot better because a lot of their work was already online and it's easier for them to tr transition to online. So these cl disparate class uh, divisions that predate coronavirus are accelerated by coronavirus. And then finally, the industries that stand to profit the most are the kind of oligarchic tech industry behemoths. Amazon is one example. Uh, Zoom is probably doing quite well, though. I don't know if they qualify as a behemoth yet, and uh, you know they might uh, uh, they might come out of this very well. They they might come out of this uh, only very well, as opposed to very very well. But obviously they're benefiting. But those industries which were already uh, in a position of dominating the American economy are only going to further consolidate that hold that they have on the American economy. So that I think is the kind of framework um, that you established in those two pieces. What would you add to that, Joel? Well, I think, you know, there, 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 there's a, sort of a great irony here. Um, obviously we're, we're losing a lot of places, a lot of jobs and that are not coming back. And, um, and these are the people in the, in the jobs that you described. You know, I was just thinking here, of the people who work at Disneyland. I mean, there's a huge amount of people who now have lost their jobs and probably are not likely to have a job in, in return. The other part of it is that we are very dependent on those people of that same class who are now working because they are much more exposed. Um, you know, we've had shutdowns in factories. You have, um, uh, you know, you have people working, my older daughter works at Home Depot. Um, and, you know, they're considered an essential business. But, you know, we're worried about her exposure uh, to the public. I mean, you know, she's doing something very necessary and she's very proud of that. And she shows up at six in the morning every day. Um, but 
you know, those people are more at risk than, you know, those of us pundits who can hide behind our computer screens. You know, I think one uh, advantage that we have coming out of this sort of in like the, the big picture macro sense is people were not actually very happy with the pre-coronavirus dispensation. And so um, maybe this is overly naive and optimistic on my part, but perhaps there's an opportunity here for some real structural change where we, we look at the, the economic dispensation in America and we say, hey, maybe this doesn't make sense for a lot of people actually, and how do we go about restoring uh, the opportunities for work that, as you've written about, Joel, have still exist in some places. Uh, you know, you've written a lot about the Sun Belt and the kind of econo economic opportunities cities once provided on the coasts that have now uh, sort of relocated to the Sun Belt. But people want work that pays well, that gives them good benefits, that allows them to raise a family, um, and that doesn't, uh, doesn't put them constantly, you know, one paycheck away from penury or, or from uh, losing their jobs. How, how might that change start to occur? What sorts of things, positive steps could come out of this? Well, there are several different things. I mean, the, the policy of more centralization, cheerleading, oh, all the smart people are in these five cities and every place else is is basically you know sort of that left behind syndrome um i don't think that was sustainable um, as a country as a society so i see three big trends one um a trend towards uh, the sun belt cities which are predominantly suburban um have had much less exposure to the virus we're already gaining jobs much faster including in, in some cases, finance and business services in particular. Um, that was one. The second is a movement which is um, just beginning, but we're beginning to see movement to smaller cities. So it's not just people moving to Dallas and Nashville and, um, and Orlando. They're moving to Fayetteville, Arkansas and, and, and Fargo, North Dakota and, and, and Springfield, Missouri. Young people, I, I spent a great deal of time this summer uh, doing interviews with people in these towns who had come from San Francisco, gay couples, artists. Uh, in, in Springfield, Missouri, they have, a nice, they have a very nice boutique hotel, some nice restaurants, and little one-of shops that, and when you interview the people, say, oh yeah, I used to be in LA, but I couldn't afford to do it in LA, so now I do it in Springfield. So those three things are happening. now. This is connected to what I would say, what you do in a city like New York. You don't want another 4 million people in New York. You know, I, I hear people say, oh, we have to be ready for 12 million New Yorkers. I'd like to put that on the ballot and see how popular it is. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think it would be very popular, except for uh, maybe some real estate developers. Um, so what that means is, as you empty out some of the what would have gone to the bigger cities, you create a, a, an opportunity to recreate the inner city um, into something that's more human. And, you know, just starting to think about how we may change the way streets are, maybe instead of putting all your, let's say, instead of Google, let's say, putting huge amounts of space in Manhattan, maybe you put a little bit of space in Brooklyn and a little bit in the Bronx and allow peop more people to work from home so that they don't have to be, go into these sardine cans every day, which the most recent research has talked a lot about the real danger of infection when you are in a unventilated small space. Um, right. More we can reduce that exposure, the better. And I think cities have to start thinking about that. Now, you make an argument, I think pretty explicitly, that in some ways the, the path of the coronavirus tracks uh, globalization. It, it yes. tracks urban density. It tracks international flight patterns. Uh, you know, it's, it is, uh, without being too um, on the nose or heavy-handed about it, you know, it's a kind of uh, a punishment for a hyper-connected, globalized society. Now, 
You know, is that not a, a kind of politically convenient way to look at it? You know, you could hear the argument, right, that, uh, okay, yes, uh, these places are more exposed, but they're not more exposed because they've made some sort of political or social mistake. They're more exposed because the same, uh, same aspects of those societies that produce their productiveness, that produce their creative ferment, require that kind of uh, connectivity. And so if you, if you try and scale down too much, you end up losing these engines of uh, creative economic life. What would you say to that? Well, I think that we're going to, ha it's just going to change. I mean, for instance, yes, at the very high level, um, I mean, I could actually see Manhattan becoming morally, because people will want more space, they'll be less likely to go in the subway. Um, the very top functions will probably stay. Um, and but I think a lot of the secondary functions will go elsewhere. And I think a lot of the skilled workers, particularly as they get older, are going to either move to the suburbs or they're going to move to more affordable places. Um, I think we're gonna be connecting more by Zoom and more by the internet um, and more in a, what the, uh, uh, William Mitchell called the, the city of bits. I think that's where the future is. Some of that city of bits will be in, you know, your traditional urban settings, but more and more of it will be in uh, suburbs, smaller cities, and even in the countryside. Um, and it's just a reconfiguration. Now, the issue is, um, do you limit uh, globalization? I think one of the things that will come out of this is a desire to have greater control over our own national and more importantly, in some ways, regional environment. There should never have been a problem about ventilators and masks. That should never have happened. Um, and American corporations have, a, uh, as well as government, have a lot to answer for. I think we're going to be looking for- you, Your point, Joel, is that that never should have happened because we never should have lost control over the supply chain and the ability to produce those things ourselves. Exactly. I mean, if you look at a company like Apple, you know, which in, insanely uh, Governor Newsom has put Tim Cook as co-chairman of the uh, uh, of the recovery. This is a guy who, who, you know, basically he's the whole company is controlled out of China. I mean, everything they, you know, they can't go to the bathroom without China. Yeah. Um, and, you know, um, you have people in the United States who want to make it impossible to manufacture, impossible to develop energy. Well, that just makes us more and more and more developed. Uh, and I'm and more and more like a developing country, more and more dependent yeah. on others. So I think there will be a sort of a return to some sense of national um, identity and security in a way that I, I think would come naturally to, let's say, the Israelis or the Singaporeans, you know, who are small countries surrounded by hostile forces. We have to begin to realize that we're also surrounded somewhat by hostile forces. And we have to be more uh, self-contained. The other thing is, on the local level, um, if you look at where there's been a great response, you have to look at, at, at places like Utah, where you know, there's a strong civil culture. Um, we see um, in um, even where we live here in Orange County, our neighbors have been great. You know, flowers out of, uh, out of stock because everyone's baking. So our neighbor comes over and delivers two pounds of flour to our house. We exchange avocados. Yeah. Um, you know, other words, people are coming together, you know, and I think there's a great need to go back to neighborhood. You know, when I was a kid growing up in New York, um, first in Brooklyn, then Long Island, but I spent a lot of time in the city, every neighborhood had a character, an ethnic character, a cultural character. Over the years, a lot of Manhattan is just one big slurb of, of hipsterdom, you know, with a, with a bunch of rich people sprinkled in and a bunch of poor people doing the service work, you know, riding the, the seven train. Um, I wish that was still true. The, the hipsters, unfortunately, can't afford Manhattan anymore. A lot of them say they, you know, Brooklyn now is like basically... Northern Brooklyn in particular is an adjunct of Manhattan. That distinctiveness between the boroughs 
has been largely effaced over the past 15 and, years. And, and, and the neighborhoods, I remember walk, one of my earliest memories of walking in Manhattan with my grandmother, who uh, had been arrested at a Margaret Sanger rally and, and also had heard Rosa Luxemburg speak. So she was quite a character. Yeah. Um, but she would say, oh, this block, when I was a kid, you couldn't go on this block because it was an Irish block. And if you were Jewish on an Irish block, you got beaten up. Or if you were a Polish block. But also that the, I still remember going to the East Village and seeing the Ukrainian restaurants and the Ukrainian yeah. churches. And that sort of texture um, has been lost. Um, and I think people are looking for something more distinctive about their neighborhoods. New York is greatest when you look at it as, as a city of neighborhoods. Yeah. It is less attractive when you it becomes a city of huts and yards. It's, a, it's such an interesting point. Let me jump in for a second just to say, I see we've got a, we've got a few questions in the Q&A right now. Uh, a couple of them are administrative, so I'll just answer those quickly while we have everybody. All times posted for Tablet Live are going to be Eastern Standard. I apologize for the chauvinism of that, but, you know, we're New York chauvinists to some extent. We're doing our best to get over that. <laughs> uh, be more regional to be localist and decentralized but what can i tell you they're all eastern standard time for now and uh, additionally yes this webinar will be available um you'll be able to find it there is a tablet live page that is on our website you can find it on the home page right now there's a link to it our twitter account has linked to it in all tablet live events are going to be posted there. So if you miss a live event, you'll always be able to watch the video afterwards. Uh, what I'd like to ask is while we have a, a few more minutes while Joel and I are talking, I would love to get some more people asking questions. I see that we do have some good questions now, but uh, we wanna hear from you. You know, this is supposed to be uh, participative and interactive. So, you know, um, you've got Joel here, you know, ask him, uh, if you want to ask him, if you want to stick up for New York and say, hey, if you want to say, hey, listen, uh, there were declensionists in the 1970s saying New York was on its last legs then, but it rallied. Why can't we see that now? If you want to ask him something about uh, the tremendous work that he's done about the tech sector or about his new book, please jump in. We've got a couple more minutes for that. Joel, let me ask you a question about the intersection of um, – the kind of social and cultural dimension of what you're talking about and the economic dimension. When you talk about how neighborhoods in New York have become more alike and the kind of homogenization of the neighborhoods in New York, which is something that I've witnessed and experienced over the course of my life, having grown up in Brooklyn, you know, if I think about the kind of valence that those arguments had over the years, when I first started hearing people complain about this sort of monoculture, I would say it was probably in the early 90s when I was a young adolescent, when I first sort of registered this, and it was part of a debate about gentrification, I associated it with the left. I thought of it as a left-wing uh, cultural argument against homogenization and a left-wing anti-gentrification argument. And increasingly, that that valence has shifted almost entirely. And there's now this sort of conservative, uh, you know, a, a return to a kind of conservative localism or decentralization that's interesting. But the other thing I would say is that when you talk about the homogenization and why it occurred at such a massive scale, how this enormous monoculture seems to have consolidated over the last 15 or 20 years where it's not just that different neighborhoods in New York resemble each other. The neighborhoods in New York resemble neighborhoods in California, which yes. resemble neighborhoods in uh, Philadelphia, which resemble neighborhoods in Paris. You know, this incredible global monoculture of a, a kind of scale I never would have imagined, this real powerful homogenization that has occurred it seems to me, and correct me if you disagree, it seems to me that that is directly tied not to deliberate cultural trends, but to very profound changes in the political economy. And that some of this kind of monoculture is really the manifestation or the epiphenomenon of changes in the political economy towards a less tactile, 
more hyper-connected information economy. And so if that's true, or if there's some validity to that, and now, post-coronavirus, we're going to shift even more online, even more to a city of bits. How can it be that we're going to shift even more online and yet also reestablish a kind of localist autonomy? How can those two things coexist? I think it's a really interesting uh, question. I, I, the first thing would be what online work allows people to do is to express where they want to live separate from where they work. That's really a big point. Like for instance, I, I work for Procter and Gamble, but I don't want to live in Cincinnati. Well, I want to live in Greenwich Village. You have that option. And then people who want that experience are going to go for that experience. So that people should be able to now have a greater ability to choose the urban or other environments that they want. Um, there was a problem, which was if everybody, if the economy of New York, which had once been, you know, when I was a kid, most of my, relative, my, my, my relatives and, and, and many of my neighbors worked in Brooklyn. They didn't work in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. but, um, they, 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 they had little factories in, in, in Williamsburg. And by the way, they drove, my father was a physician at what was then Brooklyn Jewish Hospital. He drove to work at six in the morning. He says, do you think I'm going to take the subway into, into Bedford-Stuyvesant at six in the morning? I don't think so. Um, and of course, you know, the traffic wasn't so bad at six in the morning yet. Anyway, so the, the bottom line is, you know, we used to have in New York and in other Americans, great American cities, neighborhoods that had a character that were separate, that had different restaurants, different ethnic abilities. What I have always said, and this is in the, uh, in the uh, book quite a bit and in some of my earlier books, which is the digital economy can work one of two ways. It can work to homogenization, but it could also work for diversification. I mean, just think about this. Think about, let's even take it in our pathetic industry of the media. Um, the, you know, when I think of the, of, of the publications that I think are really having an impact, uh, you can look at online publications. You know, obviously you have places like Vox and Jacobin and 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 Tablet and Quillette and Daily Beast and all these other publications yeah. that didn't exist right. 20 years ago. So that's a hopeful sign that there are now. I mean, the 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 beauty of let's say real clear politics is I can go there and I can get the left wing take, the right wing take, the centrist take. So there are those abilities, and there also are the abilities now, let's, with things like Nextdoor, to promote a local business, um, to promote something that, that is tied to the community. Like tomorrow, um, one of the, there's, a, the, there's a baking company that we like that's based here in, um, in, well, in the city of Orange, and he has a restaurant come to his bakery every, um, every day and said, here, you want to... Here's what we're going to have. You can buy this here. You can buy the bread here. And we want to support the local merchants. So, you know, I think that there, there could be something very good out of this. You know, when we go to the local taco place or the Malaysian restaurant that we go to, they say, you know, thank you. We really appreciate that. And they say, well, we appreciate you. We yeah. want you to survive. We don't want to have, look, and I, I know the founders of Panda Express, but I don't want every China, Chinese restaurant in America to be Panda Express. You know, there was that, uh, that Stallone movie of, um, that took place in the future in which every restaurant was Taco Bell. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. Demolition you know, Man, right? Demolition Man, right. It's a good movie. I mean, that, that, that's sort of some sort of, you know, horror story. Right. Um, I think about New York. I've been writing a column now about small business. And all those Greek coffee shops that yeah. used to be everywhere, yeah. the delicatessens yeah. that used to be everywhere. And by the way, as you point out, this is global. People in London are, are complaining that there aren't, the old pubs aren't there anymore. Right. People in Paris, where my wife's family uh, is originally from, they, they worry that the, the old French bistro is becoming hard to find. So can we sort of, in some senses, resuscitate the great diversity of our cultures and our, of our urban cultures. Right now, in many ways, you want really great ethnic food. 
you go to the suburbs for it. Yep. Um, so trip mall, right. Let me ask you one more question, Joel, and then uh, I see we've got a lot of questions yeah. here from our listeners. We thank you for that. We're going to get to those in a moment. But just a, a final point to follow up on what you were just talking about. How would you assess so far the impact of the relief bills, the recovery bills, in terms of whether they are going to principally benefit um, small businesses, average Americans, or whether as many people, and I think some very credi credible people are suggesting, um, they're disproportionately going to uh, large uh, corporate shareholders. What, what would you say to that? Um, first of all, I, um, I'm working exactly on this right now, um, and it is pretty clear. Look, here's the deal. Once you get Washington involved, you have two disgusting political parties which are talk about the middle class and then screw it. Um, one, you have the Republicans who are always going to serve their lobbyist base. That's just who they are. Um, I mean, there are some great people there who, you know, like my friend, Senator Ben Sass, who will point out that this is not such a good thing. But the, 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 the lobbying, once you run relief through Washington, the, the default is to help the bigger guys. Yes. This is exactly what happened in 2007, 2008, and happened under both President Bush and President Obama. Right. Right. So th there's that side of it. On the Democratic side, um, here in the state of California, which of course is one of the major marketers of lunacy on the planet, uh, we do a lot of things well, and lunacy is one of them. Um, one of the things that we, that we have is we have a bill called AB5, which is going to make it impossible, it's pushed by the Democrats, to have contract labor. Well, think of all the people who've lost their jobs and, you know, let's say um, Walmart needs 500 people temporarily or Costco, you know, the businesses where people are, um, where there really are labor shortages. Well, if they're not full-time employees, they can't be hired. Um, the Democrats really aren't interested in small business. Um, they, they may be interested in minority small business, women small business, so they can do their intersectional politics. But fundamentally, as a class, they don't like small business people. A, small business people tend to be Republicans. They tend to be pretty conservative. Um, and, um, and they're not unionized. So they're not, they're not a very good constituency for the Democratic Party. So I say a curse on both of these parties. Um, both of them are completely responsible for what is a stimulus, which is going to predominantly benefit the larger companies and Wall Street. And in this way, Trump and Obama have a common uh, theme. Uh, on that depressing note, Joel, let's, sorry. let's move on to some questions here. So thanks again. I'm going to go through these. We're going to get to as many of them as we can. We thank you for submitting them. And if we don't get to it, um, it's not because it wasn't a good question necessarily. We're just short on time. Okay. And if you want to direct the questions and they, and you want to send them to me, uh, at my home, I'll respond as well. Great. Joel, Richard Katz asks, I walk my dog every day along streets with closed and or boarded storefronts. Mm -hmm. He says it looks like a ghost town and he wants to know what can replace or occupy those storefronts next year. And let's just try and give, if possible, relatively brief questions and answers so we could get to as many as possible. Okay, I, I think, the, you know, um, I don't know where your neighborhood is, but I'm sure it's not uncommon. And some of this was happening beforehand. But the biggest thing that we've been talking about um, in here in California, because we have a housing uh, affordability issue, is some of these could be converted into housing. Uh, particularly, you know, New York is filled with two-story buildings that could be converted safely into townhomes. Um, uh, here in, in, in Southern California, we have half-empty malls that were half-empty before, and they could be converted into townhomes and even single-family homes, small lot, single-family homes. I think housing is going to be it. And then I think uh, neighborhood-serving businesses um, could conceivably be uh, better. I mean, what I'd love to see, and I do see, is some of our small uh, firms here um, have gotten very good at 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 the um, uh, at at the online part of their business. Um, we have a, an Armenian restaurant, Zavs, here in, um, in in Tustin, California, 
just doing a bang up and brilliantly run business. So I think that some retail, but I think the big thing is going to be housing um, in, in the future. Um, you're replacing some of that with housing. And then there may be some you know, lower density workspaces. Again, I don't see the future as being 50 story high rise towers in Manhattan. I see the future as much less crowded, flexible workspace um, uh, uh, in Flatbush. Okay. Um, where my father's from, by the way. Where I'm from. And uh, not that they call it Flatbush anymore, but uh, I hope that you're right, Joel. That would be it was Flatbush when, when he was growing up. Yeah, yeah, it was Flatbush and, when I was growing up. And my, my mother is from Brownsville. So as she said, a crappy neighborhood then, a crappy neighborhood now. Getting better, hopefully. But okay. okay, David Bass asks, what political effect will this crisis have on de Blasio and Cuomo? What political changes do you expect going forward? So let's stay focused on the, the New York scene for a moment. How do you think their handling, the mayor's and the governor's handling of the coronavirus is going to affect their political future in the city and state's political future? Well, first of all, I mean, de Blasio is certainly uh, proven though that he's an incompetent at, uh, in all seasons. Um, and, you know, his response was awful. Um, and um, uh, I think, you know, Governor Cuomo, um, who I, you know, I, I, interestingly enough, last, when I, when I spent time with Governor Cuomo was after 9-11, and we were talking about policies for New York uh, after 9-11 when he was HUD secretary. I think he's come off much better. I think sometimes he says things that are not that reasonable. But, you know, frankly, if, if um, Andrew Cuomo was the Democratic candidate for president, uh, I think it would be a walkover. Yeah. Um, uh, what's really interesting to me is, given that California is infinitely more important right now than New York, I think there's no comparison anymore. Um, as I predicted 30 years, 35 years ago, I, California is clearly the dominant state in this country, and Texas is second. But New York has done remarkably well politically. You know, you had the senator for New York run, you have you may want to disown him, but Trump is a New Yorker. I mean, every time I hear Trump, I keep thinking about I'm sitting in a bar in Queens. Um, uh, and of course, now you have Cuomo as a, as a serious candidate. I mean, I think if the presidential primaries were this summer, I think Cuomo would be the nominee. So yeah. New York's political influence has been greater. Uh, here in California, you know, Newsom and Garcetti are trying to use the crisis to, uh, to move forward. But for whatever reason, the grittiness of New Yorkers seems to appeal to people in a way that the flakiness of Californians do doesn't. Yeah. Yeah, I think also, you know, the for better or worse, and I think uh, for worse, frankly, but the financial sector is still a, an 800-pound giant yes. and still um, located in New York, which actually doesn't doesn't always help New York in the long run. Uh, somebody asked for the title of your book, Joel, so I'm just going to give that out again. Joel's new book is The Coming of Neo-Feudalism, A Warning to the Global Middle Class. That's coming out from Encounter Books. Joel, can people pre-order that now on Amazon? Yes. Yeah, we have a lot of pre-orders, and um, it should be out. Of, I, I haven't seen them, but uh, my, uh, my publisher says that they now have copies. Like everything else, uh, delivery is, is, everything is, you know, different. I mean, this is the first time I'm going to have to promote a book uh, um, in, in in a virtual form. I'm used to going out and going to bookstores and giving speeches uh, yeah. to crowds, and that's not happening for the time being. Uh, this is a, a kind of, I'm going to sort of combine two questions here. Uh, one question asks, essentially, if the disproportionate number of deaths had occurred in Montana rather than New York, would New York have shut down? I think um, uh, that's the <laughs> answer, but you can expand on that. And then the sort of follow-up is, it appears to those of us who are not in New York uh, that New Yorkers have no concept that New York is not America. Uh, why should we be shut down? Because the poorly run urban centers have a problem. It's our perception out here that the urban rest of America divide has been exacerbated during the Wuhan virus crisis. Yes, we call it by its name in America. So that's a pointed way of phrasing a question that I don't think is uh, beyond the pale or uncommon. And I know uh, 
look, nobody wants to be glib about the suffering and, and death in New York right now, which has been um, really horrific, but it is quite clearly concentrated in New York and, and um, has not been as much of a national right. uh, tragedy as had originally been anticipated. So how would you respond to that, Joel? Well, well first of all, I mean, obviously there are some hot spots, uh, Detroit and, uh, and Orleans Parish as somebody who loves New Orleans and spent a lot of time there and worked for Albany, Georgia. I mean, there is some stranger, right. Uh, you, know. you know, in Indian reservation, uh, yeah. might be hit a, a, uh, a, a ski town, which had an event right before. Um, but I think the point is fairly well taken. Um, the, the interesting thing, nine 11 was different. I feel I should address this one nine 11, uh, took place when New York was on the rebound. So it was not, it did not happen when New York was in trouble. Plus, all of us felt that New York was heroic. It was taking one for everyone. That's is a different situation. I mean, uh, you know, New York and Washington were targeted because of who they were. They weren't, they, they, they were. And so all of us, I think, felt sympathy and wanted to help New York. Uh, this is very different because it's a, a, a medical issue that is very concentrated in New York. And also, I think there's a, one other really sad part of this is, and I'm talking as a person who's made his life, I started working and living as a journalist since when I was 19. So that was a long time ago. The media has become so overwhelmingly politicized, so clear, actually more uh, provincial, if you want to use that term, than it ever was before. You know, in the old days, when I, I worked at the Washington Post, for instance, there were bureaus everywhere. You know, there was a there was a couple of people in Texas. There was somebody in one or two people in California. We had uh, there were people in Illinois. Newspapers, re in many ways, reflected the country much better. Even the national papers. Plus. We had very strong local papers, which we no longer have. Yeah. You know, at one time, the the Kansas City Star, the St. Louis Post Dispatch, the Louisville Courier, these were really good newspapers with a strong voice. Now we have a media that is incredibly self indulgent, that is ideology ideologically driven. You've got Fox on one end, but the vast majority. I mean, frankly, I open up, let's say CNN. You know, you try to listen to CNN. I mean. It makes you think that you know Donald Trump is some sort of cat for all the lives that he he's, he was supposed to be doomed so many times. Yeah, and he keeps coming back. So, you know, I think that this is um, I think there's a kind of arrogance there. Also, as New York has become more and more a city dominated by the very very wealthy, the very very rich. You know, as Simon Cooper in the Guardian wrote a great line. He said that New York and London is where the one percent marry each other. Hmm. Um, it's less sympathetic than it was even 20 years ago. And then you have a media that, you know, I don't, I mean, like, for instance, uh, uh, Cuomo's brother. First of all, you have Cuomo interviewing Cuomo. I mean, my editors at the Washington Post back then would have had a fit with that oh, kind of thing. They love it now. You know, they love it. And then uh, the guy's talking about suffering and lockdowns, and he's, at, he's visiting his houses in the Hamptons. I mean, don't, don't you know it, it's like with the climate stuff it's like you get you get these people saying well we've got to really you know cut off carbon footprint oh by the way i'm taking my private jet to a to a climate conference so there's a sense of separation but be, between the sort of elite new york and the rest of the country now the sad part is my family comes from working class new york in large part and I know those people, I understand them, and they don't have those attitudes um, that come off in your CNN interviews or MSNBC or, or in some of the pieces in the New York Times, although they've done some terrific stuff too. Um, and, and so that separation today between the sort of, if you will, the cosmopolitan elite population and the rest of the country is greater than it was, and the rest of the country has kind of lost its voice because its local newspapers are weaker and weaker. Nobody told you that these are anti-Semitic dog whistles, Joel? 
Uh, I don't think so. Um, a cosmopolitan elite New Yorker? Is that anti-Semitism? You don't know No, that? well, I, I would say a lot of them are, are, are Anglo-Saxons, to say the least. What? All right, shocking. Okay. You learn uh, something new every day. But, uh, but, I, but I do think that, you know, look, there is a, a problem, but I don't, I don't think this, this is predominantly seen as sort of, you know, I mean, look, you're going to have your anti-Semitic nuts on the right and the left. I'm sure there's some left-wing people say, you know, this is probably concocted in a in a uh, laboratory in Israel. <laughs> no, no, they, they, listen, I, I was being um, as as heavily facetious as I could be in my in my phrasing. I certainly <laughs> well, that, that was actually given, given the way I, I was brought up, there, there, you'd have a hard time offending me. So, <laughs> <laughs> right, I, I think I I know something about that background. Um, let me ask you, Joel. I think we have time for one or two more questions. So. Uh, this one is pretty straightforward, and it's interesting, actually. I hadn't thought a lot about the kind of differential gender impacts of this. You've talked mm -hmm. about the differential class impact, but Stephen Winmuller writes, women seem to be more adversely impacted by the virus, domestic violence, unemployment, financial challenges as single moms, etc. I would welcome Joel's reflections. Have you seen anything empirically that uh, supports that reading? That's a great question, Steve. Um... Well, the, the weird thing is the uh, physical effects seem to be hurting men more than women. That seems to be, but I think I do think that the domestic violence is a problem. Look, I think any of us who have been, you know, basically holed up with our spouse for the last, you know, month, month and a half, everybody's gotten on everybody's nerves at some point or another. Um, and I think women also maybe have a greater burden because the kids aren't at school. So going to school is what made it possible for them maybe to have a career or right. pursue their outside interests. Um, I know in the Jewish community, I've been looking at this too on philanthropy. A lot of the people who make philanthropy work are either retired or, you know, in many cases women, where are they? they they can't do that now. They, they you know, so I think there there are some bad effects and and of course probably the hardest thing is how do you if you're a woman raising kids and you've got teenagers who are, who are crawling up the walls. And I can tell you firsthand that that's not so easy. Yeah. Uh, okay, Joe, let's do one more question here. I'll give you a, um, you know, kind of more uh, pointed question, provocative question, and we'll end on this one. This is from Mark Trowen. It appears that Mr. Kotkin pines for a past that does not exist anymore and has decided that cities and density are on the decline unless they focus again on neighborhoods. Uh, and work to reduce density. Isn't the irony of this position based on old New York neighborhoods that in fact were more densely populated and disconnected from other locations? Um, what is the way forward that can embrace a future that works instead of discarding the accomplishments? So that's a kind of leading question, but I think you can see how uh, somebody, how that's a, a legitimate question also, right? I think- How I would think you address that, Joel? I mean, I think that, the, you know, the use of the past is really interesting and, you know, my particular passion, uh, every book I write has a lot of history in it. Um, but I would think that, that you, you have to say, well, what part of the past do we want to find ways to get back to? Um, I, I don't think we want to get back to the Lower East Side in 1910. Um, do we want to go back to the, 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 the you know, the Flatbush of 1950? That might be more attractive, but it's, it's not going to go back to the same thing. The, again, I keep going back to the internet and the digital economy can be a great enabler of people being able to express diverse opinions, live in diverse places, choose where they want to live so it doesn't have to be where they work. These are wonderful things. We should take advantage of them. Right now, they're being used to homogenize. I mean, if you take a look at, for instance, Silicon Valley, there is no reason why, you know, Salesforce has to have a tower in San Francisco um, where the vast majority of people can barely afford to live. Right. Why not break it up and have, you know, 50 Salesforce offices throughout California or the rest of the country? Um, that would be safer. That would be better. It would allow fam people with families um, to keep working. Um, so I, I think that 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 we have to figure out how do we use technology as a way of getting 
back to some of the positive aspects of the city because I think as as a question is, are it is very interesting. Are denser cities are less connected with each other. And may, what tends to happen these days is if I'm an environmentalist and I live in Brooklyn, my neighbors are not my neighbors. My neighbors are other environmentalists in other cities, even in other countries. Uh, can we get back to some sort of emphasis on proximity? Um, I think is a great question, but I think it's necessary because I think it's very important for how children grow up. I think it's very important in a pandemic. Again, you want to be in a place where you know you know that your neighbors are not going to steal your Amazon pa uh, yeah. package, but that they're going to help you if there's an if there's a need. Um, so you know the past is always with us. It's just a question of what parts of the past do we want to uh, re resuscitate, and how do we use new technology to do that? Um, you know, when when Ebenezer Howard started talking about the Garden City. He was talking about going back to something that had existed before, but using new technology at that time, the telegraph and, and, and the railroad to create a more humane environment. That's a challenge we have today with digital technology. And I hope we can find a way to make it work. Uh, that is a great note to end on, taking you up on that challenge. I think, what do they say, the, the past, uh, it's not even past. So thank you everybody for joining us. I'll remind you again that you'll be able to find this on the Tablet Live page. Um, the video will be uploaded there. We'll also have announcements about upcoming events. The next one is this Thursday at 7 p.m. That'll be Tablet's own Stephanie Butnick, host of Unorthodox. She'll be talking about books and the Jewish century with Keith Gessen and I know it's a Saffron Fower. I, I am very sorry. Um, I don't want to screw her name up. It is Esther Saffron Fower, Keith Gasson, and Stephanie Butnick. And that'll be this Thursday at 7 p.m. And Joel, tell us one more time the title of your book and where, other than Amazon, people can find it. Allison pointed out in the Q&A, Amazon, how dare you? Thank you, Allison. You're right. Uh, Shame to myself. Joel, well, I, where can people buy it that's not Amazon? And what's the title? I know there, there are several other sites. Uh, I have Barnes & Noble. Um, and there, I think there are sites. Uh, there's a new site that somebody just sent me that I'm looking at now. So uh, there are other places to get it. It's the coming of neo-feudalism, um, a, a, a warning to the global middle class. And it's a global book. It's not a U.S. book or a California book. It's a it's a global book. Okay. Uh, somebody asked, is there a website for Tablet? Yes, uh, there is. This is all sort of around the website for Tablet. It's tabletmag.com. Go there and you'll find this. Once again, thank you to everybody. We're looking forward to doing more of these. Joel, hopefully we'll have you back at some point. Uh, really, thank you very much for your time. This was a great conversation. I enjoyed thank talking to you. Thank you. Okay, signing off here. Uh, take care all. Look for the video on the website. Be good. Bye.